Can anyone hear me now? Hey, once you're logged on here, uh, if you guys are on here, say hello and uh, let me know if you can hear me. I messed up the audio last time. Um, <laughs> that's the second time I've done that. I had my uh, Pro Tools rig all set up. And uh, what happened is the uh, audio was like uh, plugged into my little USB thing. And so I think the, the only microphone that you would have even been able to hear would have been, oh, John says, yes, I can hear you. Awesome. Thanks, John. You're the only reason I know if, uh, if I'm out there. Barbara, hello. I see and hear you. Okay, cool. Well, um, fantastic. Uh, I've just enjoyed doing these, and I thought I would uh, reach back out again and just see if anyone was out there, if anyone's interested um, or wants to talk about anything. You guys, we can talk about anything you want to talk about on a little Tuesday lesson here. If you guys got any thoughts or questions. Abby Yanth. I hear you, he says. I see you. What's up? Glad you're back. You guys have been so kind to keep uh, tuning in here and uh, watching. I love, uh, I personally get a lot out of watching these sorts of things online. I watch all my friends' videos on these kinds of things. And uh, it's always really interesting to hear what guys have to say or talk about. And um, yeah, it's a, uh, it's really cool of you guys. Thank you. Um, yeah, we may just wait, wait, wait for a few other folks to pop on here. And if they don't, it'll just be us. I, uh, yesterday I was doing a little lesson. I was talking about uh, guitar chord shapes. And um, in the lesson, we had mentioned doing um, – uh, I had talked about doing like um, C shapes. And then we had talked about how uh, you can move that around and play. And, you know, the simplest one to think of is moving that up two frets and you've got a D. Right? And I use that a lot if you're playing in the key of G. Right? You got to play in the key of G. Play go to C. D. Just like a different way of playing. Back to C. Back to G. So that's something that's, um, you know, an, an interesting thought. Uh, that C shape, you can move it up two frets. Uh, one of the video, the, on the video I did uh, yesterday or two days ago. Uh, one of the comments was, "Hey, I, I don't really understand any of this. You know, I'm enjoying it, but I don't really understand it." And uh, that really made me laugh. Uh, thanks for the comment. <laughs> he was like, "I'm having fun watching it, but I don't understand." And so I was trying to think, what, what would be the easiest way to kind of communicate this idea of like. And that's your shape and then you go up to two frets and you get a D now this you got the G note in the D so it's like an interesting sounding you know D chord it wouldn't be the same as playing like you know this which would maybe be more true but no one's gonna play this chord um, but that same uh, principle applies if you if you move that up here, that's an E. If you if you aren't playing the open G. So what guys do is they just take half, you know, they just drop the bottom two strings, and maybe even the top string, and they're just playing kind of in this middle, they're just playing these three notes here. So you 
probably see guys uh, play this style a lot where they play like like hammer-ons. You know? You might even see them do like a little throw that the root note in there. So you can kind of in there no? so all i did on the last video is i just crank I, I just i just moved the e and the way you can kind of picture these shapes is by knowing your notes so that target note there is that e so if you're playing c there's your target note if you're playing d there's your target note target note meaning your, your root note that may not target may not mean the may not be the best way to say that uh, sliding up to E. There's your E. So I do the same thing all throughout the entire uh, fretboard here. So you can do it all the way up. You can go up to like A, which is what I did yesterday. Uh, so yeah. Or you no, know, I did G on the last video. A, B. B, that's the octave. And then you've got all your chords. Sus. Minor. So just a refresher on that. I don't know if any of, any of that was making sense on the last video, but that's kind of... Uh, someone had said, uh, could you do those shapes in the key of C? Um... And I think what he meant was instead of C shapes, what would you use for the key of C? So if you're actually in the key of C. And to that, I would say, you know, there's so many. Um, one really easy one would be to just use the exact uh, same shapes up an octave. So you got here. That's your C. So if you just climb up, an octave. So there you go. There's your note, root note. That would be your G. Back to C. F is a little tricky. You can play it like this, which is a little more straightforward, uh, or like what we call cowboy chords. Uh, or I could play like, I would probably play it more like this. Right? Or you could play. There's a couple of ways you could play that F chord, but like if you play up here, that's one way to play in the key of C. You just slide up, slide up to this chord. So there's your, you know, C chord. It's just up an octave. And so, uh, yeah, you can, you can just play it up an octave and just move around. That's one quick, kind of easy way to get to some C shapes. Uh, the other way to break that down is to see this C shape in the key of D. Or, I'm sorry, you're in the key of C, but a D shape. So you can play up here. So if you're playing in the key of C, you can play. That'd be like an F, back to C. Right? And then your five chord or your G, string, uh, G chord. Or, 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 so you're just playing. Back to C, another way to play that C if you're just wanting those two note. key of C and so I'm just seeing that C note right I'm seeing that C uh, another place to see that C is right here okay and if I see the C there then what I'm thinking is I'm thinking bar chord like key of G right uh, sorry 
key of C bar chord, uh, which is like an E shaped bar chord, right? So I'm playing. So the way I'm thinking is, okay, there's my C. I know this is one. And then my four chord is my F. I can just add. Right? And then my five, I could literally just play. Or you can play. So my, this is my kind of other position in the key of C. here uh, you could just play this for like the a minor uh, or you can just drop down to like you know or or you come back up here to your other shape so there's a lot of ways to get around this uh, but my main shapes if I was in the key of C I'd be playing around here now it's light up to here. Okay, sorry. Yeah, and then up here. And then if I'm already here, the other way to look at that is that you're part of this uh, this shape which is kind of like a G shape. Thinking about the chord G. Right, so if you're up here on in your C, it's the same shape, but you're playing in the key, uh, key of C here. Your finger has to act like the end of the guitar here, because your G shape, you know. It, you don't need to play with that finger back there, because you're your uh, the nut here at the end of the guitar is doing it for you. Right, same thing. So uh, that would be my other shape. So if I was climbing up the fretboard, I would be thinking about my shapes in C. That's one. Uh, and then probably the next shape would be this uh, bar chord here. So that'd be my C chord, F chord, G chord, back to C. And if I'm sliding up to the next position, I'm in this G shape, uh, one chord, right? F chord, G chord, or uh, F, G would still kind of be back here. Or, um, yeah, you'd have to play it here, or you'd have to play it probably here. Yeah, that, that's what it would be. My bad. So, uh, one, that'd be your C chord. F, G, back to C. I use these a lot, a lot. Uh, I'll turn down just a touch so you can really hear. And then once I'm here, I know I got this shape. Right? Okay. And then sliding all the way up to here. Okay. Refresher. say uh, it's a lot of just really basic chords but you can see 
the entire fretboard that way, right? And then once you get here, you're just starting over. So if you get here, right, you know your shapes. Those are just part of those chords that we just played. And then once you're here, you know that's your C. Well, what do you know down here about your C? That's your bar chord. So you go up here. Bar chord up here, way up high. So then you know you've got this. We just did this. Uh, same thing. You just play it up here. <laughs> if you want to keep going. High C way up here, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's very rare that you'd be up here, but you might, you know. Tuning gets a little wacky the higher you go up here, typically. Um, if you got a really good guitar, it'll help. Um, and if your intonation is good and you're not playing too hard. Okay. That was a long explanation on C chords, but someone asked for it, so I'm trying to oblige. Uh, John, you said, do you ever crank the Fulton web? You probably can't do it now. Uh, I can't really do it now in a way that would make any sense because I don't have a cabinet uh, up here. So I've got the, the amp right here, but the cab is downstairs. Um, and this amp is only 18 watts, so I actually could uh, crank it up pretty loud, and it would be okay um, as long as um, – uh, yeah – the way I've got it downstairs, it's it's in a kind of a makeshift ISO cab with microphones on it and stuff, so uh, so that I can record uh, from my little home studio space. But it's not too too loud. I mean, it would it would be really loud in here, but for the cabinet in the closet thing downstairs, it actually works pretty good. Um, so yeah, I have I think I've turned it all the way up. I don't know. That's funny. Um, but yeah, it's. Uh, that the channel that I like on that amp is pretty loud and it's pretty dirty. So I, I just go ahead and let it be pretty dirty and it doesn't take much to get there. So, uh, yeah, I do that way more. Like I would never crank the matchless all the way up or my Princeton, which is what I'm playing through right now. Those, those don't ever get turned all the way up. Um, but that actually would be, you know, you might, you might actually be able to do it. All right. Uh, anybody else have any thoughts or questions? I uh, I hope the chord shape thing makes sense. If you if if that's not making sense, uh, by all means, someone ask me if uh, there's a better way to explain any of that. Uh, uh, how do you practice when you're alone? Uh, thanks, man. Uh, yeah, uh, a lot of times for me, uh, practice is uh, it's a couple of things. Um, I will practice a song that we're working on, like that. We, it's kind of like an upcoming thing. Um, like Chris has this new uh, this new song out, and so there's a couple of new licks to learn from it. Uh, and so I've been up here uh, kind of working on that. So I'll, what I'll do is I'll play the track and play along with it, probably like everybody else does, and uh, and I'll just kind of you know work through the guitar parts for that. Um, Sometimes it's learning a uh, part from from a song that I like, you know, like a or a uh, finding a lesson on YouTube. I'll find a lesson that I really like and I'll watch what they do and try to kind of figure some of that stuff out. There's uh, so much good stuff out there, uh, and then a lot of times I, I kind of think of it almost like songwriting. For me, a lot of times uh, practice up in my studio space is um, a lot of times it's me up here practicing so i'll show you an example of what i'm talking about so like i'm borrowing this strymon um brigadier from my friend matt Podesla. so i might just hear i might just pull up a delay sound and so what i'll do is uh i might just start playing around with it and just see like if i can write something that sounds like something and I'll either record it into my phone or I might put it into Pro Tools or I might share it with someone. Um, so like, uh, so 
So I might just pull up like a, a delay sound. nothing i'm just making up something but a lot of times what i'll do is i'll just set up like a little sound like a little bit of um delay or something and um and practice for me is really just kind of like trying to hear little melodies and, and and little parts and stuff uh or maybe i'll take um you know like a figure that i'm used to hearing like a progression and i'll just try to work through different ways to play it on the guitar um and uh, yes, yeah, that, that kind of thing might be, uh, you know, useful or helpful. Uh, so a lot of times when I'm in, in my, up in my studio space or with a guitar in my hand, I'm not usually like running <laughs> scales or something. It's not practice like that. For me, a lot of times practice is more like um, doing a, uh, like a, uh, it's almost like songwriting. So uh, yeah, hope that's helpful. I don't know. I was just making something up, but like, that's kind of how these things happen, right? You just get her, you, you, you've come up with like a, maybe I'll try to find a pedal that I don't normally use and I'll plug the pedal in and just see if I get inspired or try a new delay or a new reverb sound or maybe try my amp really loud or maybe try my amp really soft or try playing, you know, for a while I was trying a thing where I took a string off. I played without this low E string and did like the Keith Richards tuning. And I was trying to see if I could get, anything out of that that sounded like something that I could use and uh, which is really fun. So it's kind of just like finding new ways to get my head in, an, in a good headspace, something different. Uh, another way that I practice uh, is I don't always practice just the, uh, the music side of things. Sometimes I'm practice, practicing like I've talked about this in another video, but like I'll actually practice the technical stuff, which sounds boring. Uh, I mean, I like it, but like, uh, I'll get up in my studio space and I'll just be like, okay, I'm going to make sure my amp hiss isn't too hissy or too buzzy. I'm going to work on that today. I'm going to try to get my, the noise floor on my preamp and my amp and all that stuff down. So when I send guitars to like a producer, everything's really clean and sounds really good. Uh, the other thing I'll do is I'll compare I'll be like, oh, which which one of these things do I like? Do I like the uh, Tele through the uh, Fulton Web, and you know, do I like the Gretsch and the Matchless, or you know, I'll, I'll play around. Even though you know, I primarily track through this. Uh, sometimes what I'll do is I'll just try pairings. I'll just pick a chord progression. Like I might come up in my studio and plug into my amp and just be like, okay, today I'm gonna go A minor, like F. C, G, and I'm just gonna play a like a, a rhythm pass uh, where I just play like. And I might play that in Pro Tools and pan it one way. And then I'll play it again on a different guitar or in a new position or with a new pedal. 
and I'll just see which pairings I'm like, I like together. Cause it's, you know, you're kind of painting with different colors and just trying to mix that stuff. So practice for me is not always just notes and scales and lead stuff. I mean, I, I need to work on that like everyone. Uh, but a lot of times it's, uh, you know, trying to, trying to figure out ways to make my world as good as I can. Cause you know, and when you go in the studio, the thing is that is so the, the most glaringly obvious thing I always come home from a studio session or a, any kind of tracking thing. And my number one thought is, okay, you got to work on being in tune and being in time. It's like, and, and being creative, you got to come up with parts quickly, but like being in tune and being uh, in time, uh, it's huge. You know, you can't put, you can't put enough emphasis on those things. Uh, so yeah, I, I'll, I'll practice all that stuff so that the next time I get called to go do something, hopefully I'm a little better each time. Uh, so I know that's a long explanation. Uh, hopefully that helps. Uh, Scott wrote, uh, so many modern worship songs use multiple guitars. What is your advice? What's your advice on playing and blending parts as the only guitar player in a band? Um, this is tricky. And I think the answer is, uh, is that I, you just kind of have to use your discretion a little bit on what, what's going to make the song sound like the song. So like, for example, if there's a part that the song like can't live without, you know, like if there's a hook in the song, that's like, it's gotta be there. Then, um, then I'll, then I'll make sure I play that. Right. Uh, so like, uh, you know, I'm just imagining, you know, if you're playing, um, uh, gosh, there's so many examples for this. How do I choose one? Uh, uh, but, uh, yeah. So if there's like a main lick in the song, I always hit that. Right. I always make sure that that's, I've got that covered and then I'll let the, you know, I might like Chris or the artist I'm working with, or even the worship pastor at our church or whatever. I'll let them decide maybe if they're like, Hey, we're not going to, we're not going to play the big intro of that song. So I'm like, okay, won't play that part. So then I got to like come up with something else quickly. Um, but what I typically will do is I'll just make sure that the song doesn't sound, if it's really big and anthemic and it sounds like a big song or a big moment, well, I'm not going to be up here like, uh, you know, playing like, like that might be in the song, but if the moment is massive and it's like the band is building and there's this big epic chorus or bridge or something. And, you know, I may not play that because that might just not work, may not be enough energy. So then I might be more like, Sorry, I'm turning my, amp, my guitar up. I might be more like. Um, so I'll either just make a, maybe I'll get the, the character of that part but I'll just make it sound more intense or maybe it's just chords, you know, once you get to that part in the song. Um, so it's just trying to figure out like, you know, if you're up here too high, you might lose some of the like body of the guitar that the second guitar player would provide. Uh, but if you're always down here, then you're not always, you're not always going to hear the parts in the mix unless the entire song is just, uh, <laughs> unless the entire song is just like, Obviously, if it's just that, play that. But if there's like a moving part and like big chords, well, sometimes my ear gets tired of hearing, you know, during a song, it can kind of like, almost like be like ear fatigue during the song. So a lot of times I'll switch. So maybe on the bridge, I go down to like a low part and build. <laughs> get back to the chorus then I'm then I 
go back up so that there's like a lift on the chorus. Does that make sense? Um, so that you've got like some tension and then a release, some tension release. Um, the other thing to do that, another way to do that is to save, you know, maybe save your eighth notes, uh, like bam, 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 or sixteenths, however you, uh, whatever, however fast the song is. Uh, you can save some of that for the end potentially and make it, um, you know, make it sound bigger. Um, but yeah, I just, it's kind of choice, you know, it's a, it's a choice thing. It's, it's like a taste thing. I just try to get, uh, I try to think about what I, what parts of the song I think are going to make sense live and I'll, and I'll pick those. Uh, so, um, yeah, Scott, let me know if that kind of answers your question. I, it's, it's hard, you know, if there's a part that just is part of the DNA of the song, you kind of have to play it. And, uh, and you got to just be okay with that. And if the song has just a bed of guitars, well then, you know, there's sometimes there's a guitar part and I've, I mean, I've played these guitar parts, they're in the songs and no one knows that that part's in there because it's buried so deep underneath keyboards and synths and uh, different random things that like, I'll just ditch the guitar part live because no one even knows that that part's in there and it doesn't matter because they're not going to be like missing. They're not going to know that it's gone. Uh, so I'll just hit the main parts that people recognize. And then ask your bandmates too, you know, like I do that a lot. I'll, I'll, I'll rely on our MD, uh, Matt Gilder, our keys player. Uh, I'll rely on his ear or I'll go to Chris or in the case of playing at church, uh, I might go to the, uh, well, we don't always have like rehearsals, so I don't usually have time to figure that out. So it's just kind of like something you got to pick, figure out in the moment. Uh, but you can rely on your MD if you got rehearsals or something, or if it's a song you play a lot, you can go in and be like, hey, what do you think about this? Do you think I should play big chords on that section? Does it sound like it's missing some like body? Or are you tired of hearing the low notes and you want to hear something chime in and, and high? Um, so Scott, thanks for the question. That's a great question. Um, I did do a video about guitar one and guitar two, like how do you mix those and what, what's the difference? Uh, it's from, you know, 30 videos ago or something. <laughs> uh, and we, is when I had just started the channel. So, you know, uh, I don't know how clearly I was able to communicate that, but, you know, Maybe be, if you haven't watched that, maybe there would, would be some stuff in there that I didn't think to cover right now that, that would, you might be able to see in there. Uh, ben, he says, hi, Daniel. Hope you're well. Uh, thanks, man. We're good. We're hanging in there. Everyone's healthy. Doing good. Uh, he said, I want to know if you're king of tone. Uh, that's a, a pedal that I use, an overdrive pedal. Uh, I want to know if your king of tone is a normal or high gain version. Also, if you had to choose between King of Tone and Full Drive, which would it be and why? Well, uh, the King of Tone I have is the high gain version, but I was reading on his website and he said it's not really, or maybe I heard this on the uh, That Pedal Show, but I think they were saying like the, the, the high gain version is not really high gain. You know, it's not that much more gain. So like, I think it's pretty, pretty close. I don't think there's much of a difference between the two unless I could be wrong, uh, which I obviously could be wrong. Uh, but I don't think it's too much. But it's it's the high gain version, but I don't use it very gainy. Uh, it's kind of a milder uh, gain. Uh, if I had to choose between the King of Drone and the Full Drive, uh, you know, I'm more familiar with the Full Drive. I've used it for 20 years on the road. Uh, so that's kind of like a little bit more comfortable because it's kind of in the Tube Screamer camp. I think the King of Tone is based on like a more of a blues breaker thing. Uh, what I like about both of those pedals is you've got two, uh, you've got some gain stages in there. So that's good. Uh, the King of Tone has two separate things. So that's cool. You'd, you'd have maybe like one channel that you could use on its own for like a clean thing and then like an overdrive channel. But they're way more expensive. Like you could pick up a full drive for much cheaper uh, than the King of Tone. So uh, bang for your buck, I would probably go i would say the full drive is is is, um, is great but i mean the king of tone is timeless and you would always be able to sell it because they fetch so much money online and right now the king of tone is the one that is on my pedal board that i'm currently using the most so it's awesome can't say enough good things about that pedal 
uh, and Mike is such a genius. Uh, I don't know him personally, but yeah, he makes great stuff. Um, the King of Tone is one of those pedals that's like, you can't find a bad tone on the thing. It's like you just turn the knobs and like, even when you turn the treble like really high, it doesn't get pure. It's like, I don't know what he does to the top end of those pedals, but like it never gets that like ice pick thing. It's like always smooth. I don't know how he does it. It's amazing. Um, so yeah, today we haven't used that on the videos. It's been the Archer pedal, uh, J Rocket Archer pedal and the RC booster. Um, just in case you want to know. Uh, John, how often are you able to uh, have your amp on stage with you these days? Uh, not very often, almost never. Uh, yeah, it's it's almost never on stage. And if it is, it's faced around backwards and it's way back by the drums and it's, you know. I don't personally, this is, this is something that guitar players have fought about for years with uh, sound engineers and stuff. And I, I gave that up a long time ago because I, didn't really matter to me. Um, but what I like about having it away from me, I know some guys like if you grew up playing in like clubs or uh, tight spaces and you got your amp right there, you're probably used to feeling the amp and that's a feel thing. I never got used to that because from day one of touring uh, for us, I was always playing in a scenario where the amp wasn't right behind me. It was usually back by the drums and it was too loud to face forward because it would be in the vocal mics or it might be right in the, um, uh, might be in the like, uh, you know, faces of the people on the front row and that, and then they wouldn't hear the band. They would only hear my amps. And so I just got used to it. Uh, and now I like it better because I have a vocal mic. I have to sing for my job. It's part of the, uh, and so when I've got the vocal mic up there, see if you can follow me here. If the amp is right here and my vocal mic's right here, well then my guitar tone changes all night because if I'm if I'm in between the amp and my mic, my guitar sounds one way. And then if I step away from my mic to like play a part or take a lead part or something, well suddenly there's like all this like bright top end information like that I don't like because it's picking up the top end speaker information. You know, it's not like having like a 57 right on your cabinet sounds great. It's like, it's the wrong kind of, it's a, you know, vocal mic from 15 feet away. And it's just the wrong thing. So when I move over, it's like, Oh, it's like, it doesn't sound right. So I didn't like hearing my amps through my vocal mic. That was one thing that I just didn't like. Um, so that's one way. I, one reason I always flipped them around backwards. And then I also just, personal choice. I, I just couldn't make sense of, uh, you know, someone paying a ticket to come see our concert or come see Chris or, or come worship with us on a worship night. And they're thinking they're going to get to hear, or they have an expectation, an expectation of what this is going to sound like. And then the, all night they're just blasted with my amps. And it just seemed selfish of me to be like, well, that's where my amp goes. It's right there on stage. And then that's all they hear all night. I don't know. It's just, uh, it's not something I, it was not a, a hill to die on for me. Uh, I just thought, well, I'll just turn them around backwards and mic them up. I like the way the mic sounds in my ears anyway. So we use in-ear molds like uh, monitors in our ears. So it's not really like I'm going to hear it on stage anyway. So right now, most of the time, it's actually off stage, back behind the stage. And we use uh, those XLR like uh, boxes to get back there. Uh, the guy that makes it, it's called TA Link. Uh, and those have been great. They're awesome. So I use that a lot. Some wrote, someone wrote MD question mark. Uh, yeah, music director or musical director. Yeah. Uh, that's what I meant by that. Uh, in, in, in our band, that's the keys player, which means he's the one who's kind of starting the song. He'll count us in on the beginning of the song. Like he'll be like, all right, Daniel, you know, he's got a mic that no one can hear out in the audience. And in his mic, he'll be on, on keys. He'll have a microphone. He might say, okay, Daniel, are you ready for the top of such and such song? Like if I've got the opening riff, he'll be like two, three, four. And then we all come in and I know when to start the song. So that's what I meant by MD, if that makes sense. Uh, 
going to back up a little bit, make sure I'm getting all these questions. This is great, man. Thanks, guys, for joining in. Uh, how often do you change your pedal board around, Jeff? Um, there are pieces that don't change much at all. I would say 80% of the board never changes. That would be like the Strymon uh, timeline, the Boss Reverb. Lately, that's been the Memory Man that hasn't moved for five years. Uh, RC Booster's been on there a long time. The Full Drive's been on there for forever. Lately, I've been trying different overdrives out. Um, King of Tones has been a, kind of a staple for me for a while. So there's always this kind of like, I'm always trying some new overdrive. So it's like King of Tone, RC Booster, and then question mark. I'm always trying something in that slot. Right now, that's the Archer. The other day, it was the Nobles. Sometimes it's been the Tube Screamer. I have an 808 that I really like. Sometimes that's the Box of Rock. Sometimes that's the Hot Cake. I'm looking around. Uh, I always like playing with new overdrive pedals. Uh, and the other thing I play with is the uh, mod or like a modulation slot. So sometimes that's the pog. Like if I've got a part that I know I have to play that's got like a, an octave up sound on it, I'll use the pog. And uh, if it's a tremolo thing, sometimes that's a tremolo. But I don't like to, I just don't like having like tw 20 pedals on my pedal board if I'm not going to use them. So I try to just keep it to like, let's see. Right now I got like seven pedals in my pedal, in my pedal chain. Now in a studio, you, you, you might need a bunch uh, and it's if, if you're moving fast, but uh, so I changed it. <laughs> yeah, I had this pedal board wired up by XTS. Uh, X stands for exact, but they, they don't spell it with an E. X A C T exact tone solutions check them out they're in nashville and they are amazing uh they built my pedal board and at the time that they built it it was a uh, diamond compressor rc booster archer full drive boss dd5 striving timeline memory man deluxe uh, tap tempo uh 1100 and the uh boss reverb uh rv5 and they wired it up beautifully and it was gorgeous and it worked great. And I just, um, I got not bored, but I just got curious about trying new things. And so I peeled a few things off and I probably shouldn't have because now my drive and compression section of my pedal board is a little messy, but that's uh, yes, I do change things, especially in the studio. I change them around a lot on tour. I almost never change it. Once I get like my stuff set, it's bang on every night. It's exactly what I want to hear. Um, so yeah, uh, let's see. Thanks Jeff for the question. Uh, like all guitar players, I'm constantly searching for the perfect overdrive pedal or the perfect boost or the perfect compressor or whatever. And then you hear guys that play with like three pedals and they sound better than anybody and it's depressing. Um, Scott, he said that was helpful. Oh, he's talking about which parts to learn for the songs. Uh, he says, as an amateur who is trying to improve, it's hard to not play a part that I spent so much time <laughs> to learn. Oh, man, tell me about it. There's been times I've spent like an hour hashing out, you know, a certain part for a song, and then we get to church on Sunday, and they just, they just don't play the song. It's like it's not even on the set list anymore. That happens, right? And then at that point, you just chalk it up to rehearsal, makes your ear better, makes your fingers better, and it plants new ideas for you in your head about ways to play uh, parts. So, um, Ben wrote, hey, Daniel, we met at Sweetwater's Worship Connect Conference five years ago. That was five years ago. Oh, my. Uh, you and the rest of the band were so pleasant to work with. Love all the videos you've been putting out. Super helpful. Thanks, Ben. That's really nice. Uh, yeah, great to meet you there. That's so cool. I, I love doing those. I'm sad that we haven't been able to do those last couple of years. That was like a highlight of the year for me because uh, it was fun being at Sweetwater because you're surrounded by gear. Uh, a quick story. We, had, um, we were at Soundcheck, and it was like there's this really wonderful, like beautiful theater 
uh, it's really well, ma- uh, you know, really nice that they would hold these little uh, seminars in. And we were doing sound check and my delay pedal just quit working. I, I don't, it must have been maybe my uh, Echo Park pedal or Memory Man or something it just stopped working. And I was so like frustrated. Um, and so I was like, I asked uh, one of the guys that was helping us, he was, works there. Uh, I was like, man, uh, uh, I was like, man, my delay pedal just is not working. I don't know what's going on. He goes, I'll be right back. And he like ran off and like came back with the, uh, uh, what's the pedal? Aquapus, like Aqua P-U-S-S. I think it's like a, it's an analog delay pedal. And it sounded awesome. And I was like, of course, you just have that here at the, uh, just ready to go. Cause of course you do. It's Sweetwater and you've got all these pedals. It was great. Um, yeah. So, uh, let's see. But yeah, thanks for saying, Hey Ben, uh, Steve, Steve Co. He writes, you are much influenced by the edge. You are right. I definitely am. Aren't we all? He's like the uh, godfather of modern electric guitar. Um, yeah, because you know the, the thing about the Edge that really that really inspired me was that he was a guitar player who played lead guitar like a rhythm guitar player. And I was when I first started playing guitar, I was playing a lot of acoustics. So I kind of came up playing like rhythm stuff and like strummy stuff. And I was playing in church. And then when I started playing electric guitar. I was having trouble finding ways, you know, for like lead electric guitar to work in the context of the style of the music that we were playing and, um, and you two and, and the edge that, that really was like such a perfect, um, it's such a perfect like way to get like all this like passion and all this like energy in the track, the way he would play but without having to play um, like blues solos, which I'm not a great blues guitar player or anything. Um, and, uh, and the music we play doesn't really require a lot of that. So I, what I ended up gravitating towards were these like two and three note little guitar lines that work within a chorus, or maybe it's an instrumental part that like repeats the same line over a progression of chords. And uh, yeah, so the edge kind of, you know, paved, paved the, uh, paved the way there for everyone to kind of like uh, figure out a new way to play lead guitar. And that was really appealing to me uh, growing up in the nineties. Well, eighties and nineties, but by the time I started playing guitar, it was the nineties and the shreddy guitar thing was just not something that I heard a lot. All the guys that I, you know, the records that I was listening to, it was like more parts based guitar playing. And that really appealed to me. So he's the king of that. Uh, so yeah, definitely influenced by the edge. Not apologizing for that at all. He's awesome. Um, pushing the fluids over here. All right. Ben wrote, have you ever thought about making your own helix patches similar to what James Duke and David Hislop from uh, Bethel have been doing? Uh, you know, I don't have a helix and um, I haven't played through one. I do have a Kemper that I use the Michael Britt matchless patches for. It's kind of a, um, it's kind of just one of my flavors that I have in the studio. And it's also something that I bring on the road in case an amp goes down. Um, and it's amazing, but no, I have, I have no, no experience with the helix or, or I don't have any uh, line six connection or any kind of way to make patches of any kind with, with that kind of stuff. Um, not opposed to it. But I just you know no I haven't I haven't I haven't spent time with that, um, so I haven't really thought about doing that. Uh, the only thing I thought about doing was when the profiler came out, the Kemper profiler. I thought well, that'd be cool to like profile my my matchless amp and my AC30, which are kind of my main two amps for touring. It'd just be cool to see how close I could get to my touring rig on the Kemper. So that's the only thing I really thought about doing. But I guess it's the same. Same thing as the, the, the Helix. 
So I, I just don't, I haven't spent the time. It seems like something that would take forever. <laughs> and I, I've never sat down to figure out how to do that. So many guys are so good at that. Like they're so good at making those patches and those, and, and I just was like, man, I don't know if I, uh, if I want to sift through all the manuals and figure out how to do all that, but it would be helpful. So maybe I will someday. Uh, Ben writes, thanks, Daniel. I'm a couple of weeks off on the waiting, waiting list for a king of tone. Man, happy days. That's amazing. I, uh, I've considered getting on the waiting list myself just because even though I have one, I thought, man, it'd be good to just go ahead and get on the list because you never know. I might want to make a second pedal board that lives with our touring rig. At the moment, it's all at home because we're not touring, but yeah, it might be good. Uh, Brandon wrote, do it. Hashtag profile the amps. I don't know how to. I need to find someone that can uh, show me how to do all that. But it would be awesome. Um, a buddy, a guy that I knew in uh, uh, Atlanta, Michael uh, Westbrook, he's been doing some great profile stuff on his Instagram. Uh, sorry, not his, his YouTube page. Let me find this out. I'm going to look it up so that you guys can see. Hold on. Has anyone been watching his uh, videos? I'm going to show you what it looks like. Uh, Michael W. Westbrook. This guy. Atlanta guitar player. Great guitar player. And uh, you guys should go check out his page. Um, uh, we were around each other a few times in Atlanta, had a lot of mutual friends and, and met him a few times. Great, nice guy, killer guitar player. And he's making some really cool uh, patches. He's really good at the Kemper and Helix profiling thing. And he even has a, um, a whole couple of episodes about, um, about how he uh, – about – Comparing those things. He, he has a matchless. I think he's got this amp and he'll compare the matchless with the profile patch and you can buy his patches. I think you can buy his patches. Uh, he's awesome at that. He's really good at it and it sounds great. And I, I've been pretty impressed. I was watching, I stumbled across his videos and uh, go check his stuff out. Uh, he'd be better uh, to answer those questions than me. And he, he's really, really good. Um, all right, Jeff, do you ever run straight to the board without using an amp? Um, uh, you know, if we're like if I'm in the studio and I've gotten the time and I, my guitar is all tuned up and it, it's feeling pretty good and I know it's like I'll tune it, I might for like one rhythm track just like just for fun plug straight into the amp and just see if it sounds better to my ear. I mean. For the most part, in a track, when you got a lot of information, uh, I mean, you can hear a difference. You can definitely hear a difference, but like, it's not always better. Uh, so, and I, and the guys that built my pedal board, it's so good. It's it sounds great, it's plugged in even with all the pedals off. So I don't, I'm not too worried about that. And and live, I never just plug straight into the amp because I, you know. For my knee, my needs live. I need you know at least overdrive, delay, and reverb. The only thing I really play with is maybe limiting the amount of pedals I have in my chain. So what I'll do is I'll just start getting rid of stuff. I'll just be like, hey, I'm gonna try to see if I can play a concert. Like once we get on tour and we're like really dialed in, I'm like, I'm gonna see if I can play a concert with four pedals, and maybe I'll just bypass my compressor and I'll just play with my overdrive delay, maybe a second delay and a reverb. And I've done that. And it's been like really surprisingly good. I'll be like, man, that's almost sounds better than my, you know, like, so that's just the nature, that's just the nature of using less pedals. So there is a difference. It does sound really good. Plug straight into the board, uh, straight into the amp, but it's just, uh, sometimes, uh, yeah, sometimes it's just too much to, uh, too much trouble to go through all that. Um, John wrote, Michael W. Westbrook, any relationship to Michael W. Smith? I'll show myself out. 
<laughs> I, I'm sure he's heard that. Uh, that's fine. Um, uh, how often do you use lower strings? You mean like these lower strings or do you mean like changing strings out with like thicker gauge? I definitely use the lower strings. Uh, but like the low E would be like something I would use for like a guitar part if I was playing like... I might use it for that kind of thing. Uh, but live, a lot of times that... A lot of that stuff can kind of get lost in the mix. And so I usually am playing, you know, the kind of the higher half of the guitar uh, and then just finding it's, yeah, low E and A, he says. Okay, low E and low A. Yeah, I do use them, of course. Um, it just depends on the song. Uh, but for a lot of lead parts and stuff live, it's just hard to get those things to translate. Um, and so I'll use... Uh, you know, single note lines that are on like my, you know, uh, D string or D or sorry, G, B and E. So like, you know, I, I kind of live up in there, you know, maybe up here, but I, you know, it's rare that I'm like down here, like, I like it. It's fun to play, but it's just sometimes it's hard to get that stuff to. The only the the exception would be if I'm playing rhythm guitar, like when we were touring a few years ago. We had another guitar player out with us, Jack uh, Parker, and there's a few songs where he was playing um, like more lead style guitar stuff, and so I would be down playing like big chords down low, like. You know, like rhythm then you know, you're going to want to move with the bass line maybe or the keys part and kind of um you know play those play some of those parts um also an example would be a few times sometimes i have to do like a drop d tuning for a certain sound we did that for a performance that we did uh for tv uh for uh for good friday for the song holy water it's a um we the Kingdom song, and for that I tuned the E down to D. So I'm playing the E string. It's not it was a D, not an E, but I was I definitely was playing. I was definitely using it. Um, yeah. So yeah, it happens. Uh, Tim, hello, it's Tim. Uh, Michael's videos are great. Tim says, as are yours. Man, that's really nice. Thank you. We should do a worship uh, guitarist chat. It would be fun. Count me in. I would love that. Those guys are awesome. Um, Tim is a fantastic guitar player and uh, has become a buddy over the years. We've done a lot of uh, uh, events together out on the West Coast for uh, for Harvest. And uh, he, Tim does great videos as well. Uh, his stuff is awesome. Let me see if I can find his uh, page so you guys can see it. Um, He's done some really cool stuff, especially recently. Tim, his his page is awesome. He did this uh, episode recently, a month ago, uh, where he did this. Uh, so there's this pedal that everyone loves in Nashville called the Mostortion, and 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 in, well, I say Nashville because that's where I live. In LA too, it's kind of a session guy pedal, but all these guys love them. And Tim did this amazing video uh, where he breaks down this pedal and it's called the uh, Dan Electro Roebuck. And you can see he's, uh, come on. He plays all these different guitars through it. Sorry, there's no audio. You have to go to his page. Anyway, he does like the pedal demo. It's really good and it sounds amazing. I'm like dying, dying to try one of these pedals. Tim, where did you get it? Uh, I think that must be new. Tim, is it a new pedal? Maybe you guys can, uh, maybe you guys can, um, 
You can enlighten us. Are you guys able to see on the chat? Can you see other people's questions? I don't know. I can see everyone's questions. I don't know. Are you guys able to see what other people are writing? I've never known. Um, so thanks, Tim, for chiming in. Let's hang out online. Tim's awesome. Uh, Steve, any thoughts on an instrumental album? Steve Coe, uh, do you do you mean like, do you mean me like, me making an instrumental album, or do I have thoughts on an instrumental album that I like, or would I record with somebody for one? I don't, you know, I don't really know. If you mean me, you know, I, I like that kind of stuff, and I'll noodle around sometimes, and sometimes I'll record that kind of stuff at home. But uh, you know, I've just never, I don't know. <laughs> that's a tricky one a lot of guys put out some really wonderful stuff out there and i just never i never felt fully i don't know never felt really fully comfortable with do, with doing that for some reason i've got a great job i love making records with the guys i make records with and uh maybe someday i don't know sometimes I, i've got a, like a whole kind of file of like these little things that i make up and so Maybe we'll do something with them someday. Ah, uh, DC. Hey, those are great initials. How do you get all that sustain on Let God Arise? It sounds awesome. Throwback. Uh, okay, the answer to that, I remember we were, if you mean the album, if you mean the album version, I think we were using, uh, I had at the time, I had a uh, Tele Deluxe that had the humbuckers in it. It's like an old 70s, like uh, brown Tele Deluxe that had humbuckers in it. I sold it, but it was really a, a great sounding guitar. I have the thin line now that has the same pickups. Uh, and I was using, this pedal. Like the big box rat was on my pedal, you know, so you can tell I toured, I toured hard with this pedal. So I had this pedal on. And I remember when we were in the studio, we were like, man, the, the verses just have this like one long chord. There's like no chord progression. And so I thought it'd be fun to just like, ba -ga -ba, just like hit like a big chord and just like let it be really gnarly and nasty. And like, how do you do that? Like, what do you do? So like we literally, I stepped on like, every pedal I had on my board. Um, so it was this and I think this was on there. I was using that reverse delay setting that I used a bunch uh, around that time. And I think I turned the feedback like way high and I had the rat really ratty and distorted. And I just hit like a big chord. And there's probably another overdrive pedal on, maybe this plus the full drive or something, maybe the reverb. And I just let it in the studio. We had the monitors cranked really loud and I was playing like overdub style in the studio, which means it was me and the producer. I don't know. I, I don't think the band, I, you know, just get, we were working on just guitars at the time. And so when I hit it, it kind of almost would feed back in the room and it was just like had all this nice sustain and we just like left it in the track. I had all this, swirly reverse delay in there and a lot of fuzz from the rat and it just worked and uh we left it in there um you have a good ear that you can hear that uh it was just kind of like a gnarly sound from stomping on you know we just i literally turned on like four or five pedals then it was if i would have not hit anything it would have been so noisy and so like it would have you know been this horrible sound so uh, but when you played played the part, uh, it was great because the part was just um, two notes, right? I think it's in uh, A. Uh, I'm not plugged in. Uh, I thought about that song today. That's so weird. Because I was trying to figure out if I could still play the uh, chorus part. Chorus guitar part was like this.
so yeah, the uh, yeah, so it's uh, it's just an A chord, I think, at the top of those verses. And when I say A chord, it's like just three notes. I'm muting everything else, but when you put a lot of sustain and dirt and like you know, you make it really nasty. It's just turning a bunch of pedals on. Uh, yeah, Tim wrote back. He said, uh, killer pedal, Mastortion circuit. Yeah, that's the pedal I was talking. Did I not say? I'm sorry. I get all excited up here, and I forget what I'm talking about. Yes, the pedal, the Mastortion pedal that everyone loves. Uh, it's that circuit because uh, it's not a pedal that they make anymore. Ibanez, Mastortion. Uh, but, yeah, that Roebuck pedal was cool, man. Golly, it sounds good. Y'all got to check. Seriously, you have to go. Check out that video so you can hear how good that um, how good that pedal sounds, and you can hear how wonderful Tim sounds. He is a uh, killer guitar player. Uh, yeah. Oh, DC says that's fantastic. Thank you. I hope that helps. I'm barely remembering if I'm playing those those riffs right, uh, but I know that um, yeah, it was definitely that rat pedal. And live, I would use that rat for the main riff too, which is like. The which note was it? Which note? I can't remember. I think it's that one. And then there was like a little pre chorus. the decade maybe more uh yeah it's something like that um so thanks for the uh suggestion that was fun michael powell oh my goodness he says what up old friend love you dude okay michael and i went to church together in austin texas a long time ago a long time ago and michael is one of my favorite people love that guy what's up michael good to hear from you Really funny too, man. You make me laugh. Okay. Uh, man, we've been at this for an hour. And uh, several of you are still here. So thanks for thanks for uh, sticking around. Uh, Tim wrote, ha ha, you're so kind. Thanks for sharing that. And he said, yes, the Dan Electro Roebuck is new. And man, I'm happy to share it. Uh, maybe I should just, just talk about things I like watching. Uh the Michael uh, Westbrook's channel is really great. I love watching Tim's channel. They didn't know I was going to say this. We're not in some sort of cahoots here. I just uh, that's just stuff I like watching. I like uh, uh, Guthrie uh, Trap. His channel is really good. I love watching his stuff. He's got um, you know just amazing player. And uh, trying to think of what else is out there. There's a lot of good ones. A lot of good ones with great information uh red shoals channels great it's got a bunch of good stuff on there i've watched some of those really good for dialing in tones and parts and eqing things and uh yeah well y'all this has been fun unless you got some some other questions i may uh i may go take care of some stuff around the house here or go work on some more music um Steve Co wrote, yes, solo instrumental album. Uh, yeah, I mean, like I said, maybe someday, right now, no plans. Michael Powell, is Party one of your all-time favorite worship songs? <laughs> what can I say? It had its moment, baby. It had its moment. Okay. Uh, anybody else got anything? I'm, I'm happy to st stick around. I just... Uh,
Happy to answer questions on here if you got them. Um, I like doing this because it's kind of like a, uh, it's like a guitar clinic, like a pop-up, pop-up guitar clinic. I don't plan it. I don't ever, you know, I should probably mention it, you know, somewhere so that people know to come check it out. But it's fun to just, uh, it's fun to just pop up on here and see who's out there. Have you ever sung lead? John says, uh, no, not in, um, not in our band. I, I've led, I mean, led worship at my church uh, here and there over the years. And uh, it's always been a part of my life. That's something that I do sometimes, but, uh, but yeah, no, not for, not professionally, not really on tour. Um, how do you play the solo for party? I couldn't even, I could not even begin to tell you because I don't, I don't, I, I, no, I don't know. I think it was an E. Am I still on? I remember that part. That's it. I don't remember the rest. Uh, Peter wrote best best Nashville hot chicken. Okay, I'm horrible at this. I just think the wrong person to ask. Um, Hattie B's. Someone wrote yes. That's I hear that a lot. Hattie B's. Go check that out. Um, I'm just the wrong person to ask. I'm so sorry. That's not something I not something I go check out. Um, I can give you other suggestions. I really like uh, uh, Desanos for pizza. Um, Moss Tacos. Ooh, there's a new taco place uh, actually called Ladybird Taco that a buddy, his name is Gabe Scott, amazing guitar player. Um, he has been working on this like uh, taco recipe with some guys from Texas. Uh, <clears throat> so their whole thing is that's a little bit of Texas in Tennessee, which speaks to my heart as someone who uh, grew up in Texas and has a huge love for Texas. Michael Powell, I know you do too if you're listening. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so uh, yeah, he started a taco joint here called Ladybird Taco, and it is fantastic. So, that's my new favorite spot. Uh, Brandon Wright, literally watching the live party video because of this chat. Hey, I, I would be shocked to hear it, I'm sure, because it's probably, probably sounds different in my head than, you know. Uh, um, that's so funny, Brandon. Uh, best AC30, Peter writes. I mean, my favorite is the six channel one, the TB, TB6, English made. Uh, second favorite would be, uh, there's a series that they put out in 2003, uh, called, uh, I think they just called it the limited edition or something like that. It's a hand wired. It's like hand wired 2003 box AC 30 hand wired limited edition. And that's my only other AC 30. I have that one. It's got the blue speakers and it's just a really well-made AC 30. And I keep that on the road with me. And that, when that goes down, uh, when my main TB6 goes down, which sometimes it does, I use the hand wired one and it sounds awesome. He wrote custom classic, LOL. <laughs> yeah. The custom classic is the, the, the Chinese made AC thirties that I don't love them. I've had to use them and I've, we've played places where the rental gear was there and that was what I had to work with. And if that's what you got, you just, you know, you make do. Uh, but it's not my favorite of the AC30s. Um, and if you have one, it's okay. Use it. You can great. You can make great music out of anything. But it's not my favorite. Uh, John said, "Have you ever uh, ever tried a treble boost booster with your AC30?" I've never had a treble booster. I, I like overdrive pedals and uh, boost boost pedals and occasionally compression. That's kind of just the world I live in. Uh, I'd be up for it. I've heard that they're great. Uh, Mainly from, uh, I, I, I would have never really given it much thought except that I saw a few episodes of uh, that pedal show where those guys are doing treble boosters. So those, they make it sound great, but, you know, I don't, I, know, I don't have, I have no experience with them. 
Ben wrote, uh, of, out of all the lead parts you've written over the years, is there one that sticks out as your favorite to play? <sighs> well, um, man, I always, I, at the top of, uh, it's one of the best, it's, it's one of my favorite songs to play live. And that's uh, Whom Shall I Fear or uh, Angel Armies. And that lead, that riff at the top, uh, I love playing because it's, um, you know, it's always uh, it's always just a special moment in the night when we play that song. And that's kind of the turning point. You know, it's like we usually come out of some worship time and then here comes the kick drum and the intro to uh, Whom Shall I Fear. And that always feels like, um, it feels like the right thing in that moment. I always love playing that part. Um, and uh, I guess the other one that would come to mind would be uh, the song, uh, Our God. So just that simple little melody on the B string is something that I never would have dreamed I'd play for the rest of my life or that I would, <laughs> we were just in the studio and I started playing and that's kind of what, that was like the first, my first kind of gut instinct with the song and everyone kind of loved it. And, and I just, I, I, you know, I almost felt like it was too simple. I remember being like, or should we, you think that's, should we go back and redo that? And everyone was like, no, 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 we love it. We love it. Let's keep it, keep it. So there you go. Uh, so yeah, that, those two songs, probably, those are probably the two that, um, that I've been able to, you know, right that that I got to play over and over. The funny thing about the "Whom Shall I Fear" guitar part, while I'm thinking about it, is that uh, it was not originally the intro. I remember we were in the studio. Story time with Daniel here. We were in the studio, and um, I was. Uh, we were playing. You know, this, I don't know if the record version is in C. It might be C sharp. <laughs> I had this this idea for a guitar part that was like um, uh, something like that, some like little climbing guitar part, and so I, was ha I had like a lot of reverb on, and I think I was playing like. some like little part like that and uh it was it was working in a way but it wasn't like the right thing for the intro so ed our producer was like hey uh uh let's uh let's move that to the verse so we ended up putting that on on the first verse of the song there's like this little like getting lost in the, in the part if i played it live i could play it but for some reason i it's lost in the moment uh so what happened was he was like hey let's do that in the verse so we did that in the verse and then when we got to the bridge the bridge chords are like these um i'm gonna be i'm gonna be way out of tune now that i'm throwing this capo on um but the chords on the bridge were like this four one five uh, progression so that's like the bridge progression and I like I like guitar parts that just kind of sometimes just play the same thing over an entire progression and you don't you don't necessarily change just because the chords change and so I like that kind of thing. That's fun for me. And so I had, I had come up with this part. We were just playing. A lot of times when we're working in the studio, <clears throat> we'll just start a, a, in the middle of the chorus or the bridge or something. I'll just pick up. I'll just like, hey, just drop me into the middle of that chorus, and I'll just start kind of going fishing. You know, I'm just like looking for a guitar part. Just find something that works. So uh, this might get too loud. 
I want you guys to be able to hear it, so that's why it's so low. So the tone's not going to be very cool, but or inspiring. But what I'm trying to get at is the bridge was the main guitar part uh, of the song eventually. So what happened is we get to the bridge and I start playing like a because it was like this four chord, right? Nothing formed against me shall stand. So I was playing. So when he got to the five, and so I was kind of playing this little like bouncy, like I just wanted some movement in the, and I wanted something that had some like gusto and some guts, you know? So I was kind of playing this like. And it had like a delay on it. And it was just kind of something that kind of moved in the track. And I was like, man, that's cool. That feels good in the bridge. And, um, and so we were done for the day. And I think the, um, the intro that I had played was all just kind of atmospheric guitar parts with like this little kick drum and like a piano. And then the song starts. So we didn't really have like a guitar intro. And so Chris came by later that day uh, to, to chat with our producer, Ed. And, uh, and so Ed was like, hey, let me show you this, uh, what we worked on in guitars. And he was like, this, there's this really great, you know, cool guitar part that I think is going to be really cool for the bridge. So he pulls up the guitar part, just wanted to, I guess he liked it. He just wanted to show Chris. And I wasn't, Chris wasn't there when I was recording. So he, uh, at the time, it was just me and Ed. I think my wife was with me at the time. She'd come up with me. Uh, we were in Atlanta, but we drove up to Nashville to record some guitars for the, for the record. And she was with me uh, before we had kids. And uh, so, yeah, he was, Ed was really excited. And uh, he was like, hey, let me show you this guitar part on the bridge. So he pulls it up. And when he did, uh, Chris was like, that's the intro of the song. And so they just took that guitar part and put it on the beginning of the song. And it became uh, kind of the intro guitar part that is kind of the, I guess, the uh, the hook, the first thing you would hear, maybe the identity of the song, the first thing you would hear at the beginning of the track uh, or even beginning of a live performance. So, uh, so that's kind of a fun thing for me, just knowing kind of how that all came together. And uh, it's funny, you know, it's like it took three people to – figure out where that guitar part goes because even though I technically wrote it, I wasn't thinking of it as an intro part. And it took um, Chris <clears throat> who has such good ears, uh, Chris to be able to be like, that's the, that's the thing for the beginning of the song. So there you go. That's kind of fun. Um, what time is it there? It's like 10 AM here in Honolulu. <laughs> hey, Emmanuel, it's three o'clock in the afternoon here. I wish I was in Honolulu. Sounds awesome. Uh, ben writes, when dialing in a tone in your Princeton, do you approach it the same way as the video on the matchless? <clears throat> Sorry, I'm just talking a lot. So I, it's not my, uh, my throat's fine. Uh, the, uh, you know, it's the, the Princeton and the Fender thing. I, I do run it a little differently. It's more, I run it quieter. Uh, and it's, it's only got bass and treble controls. So there's no cut. And um, uh, I run it, like at the moment, based on three. Because, you know, you give it too much bass and you, you can't hear what you're doing. Uh, treble's on five, four and a half, five. Volume's on two and a half for the sake of playing on this video because I knew the camera on the computer was – not going to handle um, too much of an overload on the guitar here. Um, so yeah, I approach it a little differently. You know, I, I do. And for church, like I've had to play this Princeton at church a few times. I just bring it with me. I just set the volume on like three. And I think I put the treble and the bass on like four and four for live. Um, and then I just kind of forget about it. I do all my EQing at the pedals because I've got my ears in and that's kind of the end of it. I know some guys use them at like four, maybe live, four, four and a half for like a, a little more. <clears throat> this has a 12 inch speaker in it, so that reacts differently than the 10 inch that it came with. Um, it is different. You know, I, I would definitely run that matchless or the AC30 where they're breaking up a little bit more. And they just have that like chime and that like grit that I love. 
uh, which is why I choose those amps live. But the for the Princeton, I kind of use I do use it a little differently. Um, it's set more clean, uh, and I use the the drive comes from pedal. So I'll pick something that's got some ni nice mid <clears throat> boost, like a tube screamer, or maybe the King of Tone or this Archer or something, and it kind of fills in that gap so that it's not so mid scooped uh, in the in the Fender uh, style. Which I kind of learned some of that stuff actually watching that uh, that pedal show. Man, they've got like so many cool videos on like mid boost and mid scoop. I, mean, I, I learned a lot watching those. Um, before that, I was just kind of trial and error, like to my ears. I didn't really know what I was hearing. Um, hope that helps, Ben. Emmanuel, thanks for saying hi. You guys are awesome. John wrote, did you know Whom Shall I Fear is Tim Tebow's walkout music when he goes up to bat? No, I, I, of course I didn't know that. That's amazing. Tim is such a stud, man. What a beast of a of a guy <clears throat> that's really cool did not know that that's pretty amazing uh yeah uh abby anth wrote my first song i learned on guitar was our god both acoustic and lead man that's so cool what a honor i'm honored that that's that that's the case uh that's really a special thing to me that you guys would um that you guys would learn the music that we play and record. I mean, it's just crazy to me. It's crazy. God has been really good in that way. Um, can you play the intro to Enough? I know I'm dating myself here. <laughs> yeah, sure. Why not? Uh, we played that song live for years. I think we played it in A flat. So I played... When you're playing A flat, you know, it's a terrible guitar key. Uh, so I just play with the capo on. This is one of those that um, we didn't have a, you know, <clears throat> the first version of this was on a live passion record back in like 2001. And uh, we didn't have guitar parts for a lot of these songs. It was just, it was, it was a different time. And Chris would start every song on acoustic. And then we would just kind of fall in by like the first chorus or second chorus. You know, it's just kind of like very free flowing. Uh, we didn't have producers showing us the way back then. And, um, or at least I didn't, uh, I didn't know what I was doing. And so we were playing the intro it was just kind of Chris going like. <laughs> And so I, uh, we were on tour and I knew there was going to be a night where we had to record it. And it was just kind of like what kind of had, what I had kind of been playing was just kind of this little. So that's, you're just kind of hanging out from G. Sorry, it's not really G, I'm, I'm capoed, but from the root note up to the two. So on the actual fretboard here, I'm four and six. And then the little uh, back half of the lick is open string. So that's the whole lick. It's kind of a finger stretch. So I would play it like this. So that's just an open chord. I'm only playing the G, B, and, and E strings. <laughs> this is the hard part. <laughs> 
Uh, so yeah, that's how I played that guitar part. Um, Abby Anth, I'm very much honored to be on the live. Uh, thanks for the love for these videos. Yeah, man, you're welcome. This is so cool. Uh, so yeah, there's, uh, this guitar parts for enough. Um, I don't know if that's, uh, if that's helpful there, Emmanuel, thank you. I don't remember if there's any other guitar parts on that song. I, back then it would have been a lot of kind of power chords and stuff. Uh, Steve Co writes, your favorite guitar, question mark, telly, question mark? Probably, yeah. Probably the telly. For years, my Les Paul was my other kind of love, so telly and Les Paul were kind of home base for me. But lately, if I had to pick one thing to like make a whole record with, it would just probably be a telly. Uh, Passion, Our Love is Loud. It was my gateway album to mar modern worship, LOL. Got me out of Maranatha, he says. Okay, yeah, I don't know too much about that, but... Hey, man, I love that. I love that. That's so cool. Thanks for saying that. Uh, $10 on Amazon. Buy it now. <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, yeah, I'm sure I'm sure it's out there. I still have a copy in my big – I have that big CD case. Remember when you used to carry around like 50 to 100 CDs in that big thick case in your car? And you'd be worried that someone would break your window and, and steal your CD. Now they're – no one, of course, would do that. Uh, but yeah, I still have my my copy of Our Love is Loud. I remember being so excited because it was the first thing I had ever played on uh, <clears throat> that was released in like a kind of in a national kind of way on like a on a rec record label and everything. So that was a big a big deal in my life. That first that passion, Our Love is Loud. That was the first thing I played on, and then the first studio album we played on was called um, Not to Us. Uh, Chris's first like label album and uh, that was the first time I played on like a studio record and that man <clears throat> that changed my life those two records just being able to hear myself or hear the music in that content I, I was so young I didn't know what I was like 18 19 years old I didn't know what I was doing I guess I was 19 19 20 and uh, thankfully people had patience with me and, and it helped me along the way because I did not know what I was doing uh ben says what's your favorite telly that you own okay i only own three uh before uh, i know that that for some of you that might sound insane but i have been it's been a couple of decades of touring so i've collected a couple uh this nash one uh is one of them i have my blonde telly that i play uh in the videos some and then i've got the um the thin line 72 thin line um and so I guess my favorite, I mean, you know, I'm a sucker for the vintage stuff. So I think my favorite, <sighs> you stumped me. It's either that blonde 74 single coil or the 72 thin line. Uh, both of them are, I, they would be like two of the last guitars I would sell. Uh, I've been so heavily relying on them for years for touring. And the blonde one's been with me the most. We recorded so many songs. Uh, with that blonde one, uh, especially on Chris has an album called Arriving, and we use that blonde telly on so much of the record uh, through a AC30 and, and Matchless, um, with not a lot of other effects. It was mostly into those amps, and um, so that, that guitar means a lot to me. Um, and then the Thin Line I've had for five five years or so, and been touring a lot with it. And it just it's just one of those guitars. Sounds great. So I hope that's an answer. I don't know if that's an answer. I can't choose between those two. Uh, although the blonde one I have more history with. Let's see. Back when I used to uh, buy stuff on eBay, my, my handle on eBay was like something about that blonde telly. So. Uh, hi, Daniel. What's your opinion on ant modelers? Thanks. Uh, I don't know if you say your name, Matthias or Matthias. Uh, thank you, man. Thanks for commenting and saying hello. Uh, I don't have a lot of experience. I've got this one Kemper. It's just the profiler, just the Kemper profiler amp. And uh, I've never profiled any of my stuff. It's, that stuff's great. The stuff that's out there, it's getting better and better. I mean, you guys know this. It's amazing what they can do now. But that's the only one I own that I have experience with. Um, 
I know on some recordings that we've been a part of, I've seen producers pull up Logic and just plug straight into Logic and do like a uh, one of the amps in there. Guitar rig is really good. Um, I've had a little bit of experience with that. <clears throat> but the Kemper is kind of the best I've heard of at that stuff. Helix, I know, is the other one. And I just don't – and Axe Effects, I guess, is the other one. And I just – I have never played either of those. So I can't really comment on Axe Effects or Helix. But I know some really – really great guitar players that play that have big time touring jobs uh, with big, big artists that play acts effects and stuff live. So I know it's, it's legit. Uh, but as far as the, out of those three, I don't know what's best because I, I only have experience with Kemper. Um, but uh, yeah, thanks for commenting. Uh, I hope I didn't miss any questions here. Make sure I didn't. You guys are so nice. Um, ben, I'm sorry I missed your, your pedal about guitar, lead guitar uh, parts. You had to write it twice. Apologies. I didn't see that. Man, thanks so much, guys. This has been really cool. I'm going to take off. I got a couple things to get to, uh, but I wanted to take uh, an hour or so and just get on here and try to answer some questions. This is a fun way for me to do this because there's a lot of things that I don't always think of for, uh, for videos, but uh, yeah, for content or whatever. Uh, but doing it this way is really fun because I get to talk to you guys in, in, in real time and answer some questions. So very cool. Thanks so much for uh, watching and subscribing and liking the videos and commenting, man. It's just so cool to watch this thing uh, grow a little bit at a time. And I'm just uh, hopeful that we can continue to do this. It looks like, unfortunately, it looks like uh, touring is not happening anytime soon and quarantine is part of life now. So I'll be in my studio and we can do some more of these videos. Uh, so hopefully we can keep going by all means comment, um, here on other videos. Let me know what more you guys would like to see more song tutorials or more breakdown of the fretboard, unlocking the fretboard, more chord shapes or, uh, lead guitar parts or, you know, stuff like that tone stuff, pedals, you know, what are you guys into? You let me know. Okay. I'm going to sign off. Thanks you guys. You're the best. Let's do this soon. This was really fun. Thanks again.